تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين اتقوا إذا مسهم طائف من الشيطان إذا مسهم طائف من الشيطان تذكروا فإذا هم مبصرون وإخوانهم يمدونهم في الغي ثم لا يقصرون صدق الله العلي العظيم Dear brothers and sisters, illuminate your hearts and minds in this majlis. With a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. There has been a pre eternal. Qala Allah Ta'ala fi kitabihi al kareem. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters, illuminate your hearts and minds in this majlis. With a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Abu Dhar al Ghifari was once asked by some of his companions, Why is it that people fear death? You find many people are really incredibly uncomfortable surrounding the subject of what? of death, of our eventual, certain mortality. And you find studies show that among the top fears of Americans, you think death would be number one, right? The number one top fear of Americans is public speaking, followed by spiders, followed by death. So if a spider were to jump on me right now, this would be perhaps the scariest thing to ever happen. May Allah prevent these spiders from arriving here. You find the topic of death is incredibly uncomfortable. Some people, in fact, find it triggering to even think of their own eventual mortality is something really, really uncomfortable. That's why you find most people throughout their days, throughout their weeks, rarely mention death. Have you ever attended a gathering where the subject of that night was death? Besides the Husayniyat and the mosques, do you ever hear talks about death? Do you hear people gossiping about death? What's going to happen to us after we die? Why we die? What happens to our bodies and the way we decompose after death? Does anyone ever talk about that? So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was asked, why is it that people fear death so much? He said, because many of us, we build and we build and we construct in this dunya, right? We build our financial empires. We build our material possessions. We grow our families. We travel around this world. Our roots are deep attached within this dunya. Whereas, what? We leave the akhirah underdeveloped. Did we put the same amount of passion and energy into the akhirah that we did into this dunya? Did we put enough energy into matching the scales of our amal? If our portfolio of investments is 500 pages deep, how deep is our book of amal? And so he says the fear is that 
we, many of us, we travel from a highly developed area, a highly constructed area, this dunya, to an extremely underdeveloped area, the akhirah. That's where much of this fear stems from. So then his companions asked him, for the muhsin, the one who has done good in this dunya, the one who did not neglect his akhirah, who constructed within it, how does he meet his Lord? And for the one who is the musi, the exact opposite, the one who neglected his godly duties, how does he meet, he or she meet Allah Azza wa Jal? He said, as for the muhsin, he or she meets Allah Azza wa Jal the same way a person meets their family after traveling for a long time. If you've ever traveled for business or for work or even for leisure, after you go back home, you open the door, you see your young daughter, your young son, your wife, so eager with excitement upon your arrival, that's how you will meet your Lord. However, for the one who is the Musi, the Musi meets their Lord the same way a disobedient slave meets their master. If you're a criminal running away from police and then they eventually find you, what kind of fear and terror will you be in? That's the kind of state you are going to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. This is narrated from Abu Dharr al-Ghafari. You find there are numerous, numerous, numerous references within the Holy Quran and the Hadith canon regarding the Akhirah and regarding death. Almost every page within the Quran has a reference to what? The Akhirah. وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانَ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Right? It's the Akhirah that's the true everlasting abode where you will stay eternally if only people knew. So some might pose the question, why is it there's so much emphasis on death, death, death? I mean, here we're in this dunya to live, right? Isn't that the goal? To live. Why are we, some might pose it this way, wasting so much time discussing death? Let's just get on with our lives. Let's discuss what's important, life, right? And let's just leave death, you know? When it happens, it happens. What's the point in discussing and putting so much emphasis on death? There's two reasons, my dear brothers and sisters. Inshallah, we'll discuss after a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first, my dear brothers and sisters, is that this is a misconception to say, why are we focusing so much on death at the expense of discussing life and the affairs of this life? Why? Because in reality, death within the Islamic paradigm is life. If you take away the Islamic paradigm, yes, death becomes what? Cessation of life. Just become dust. After you die, that's it. That's where the story ends. But if you subscribe to the Islamic perspective, death is what? Simply a new chapter in your book. Death is a transition from one form of life to another form of life. And in fact, a higher form of life. You find even on this earth, there's various forms of life. You start with what? Plants. Plants have no intellect. No desires, no thoughts or impulses that we know of as of yet, right? That science have discovered. You find you go a step up, there's animals, right? They have more, they're more animated. They have desires, they have simple intellect. And then you go up, you find what? There's the human being. With intellect, with reason. But even us, my dear brothers and sisters, we're limited. Because we're in a form that is limited. This dunya limits us. The true everlasting life is the akhirah. The akhirah, the afterlife is the true abode, is the area where we genuinely live, according to the Quran. You find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, those who neglected their duties in this dunya, what do they say? Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. Oh, I wish I would have prioritized my life more. 
This is someone who what? Who passed away. Why are they saying, I wish I would have prioritized my life more? This life, this dunya, no. They're referring to the akhirah. You find those who die call the next life that is awaiting us life. It's as if what we're in right now is not genuine life. And we find there's a hadith that supports it. There's a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt that says, niyam, people are sleeping. When they die, that's when they truly begin living. That's when they begin realizing true reality. Someone that's blind from birth, right? Imagine someone grows up, they're blind from birth. Can you describe to them what color is like? How things look like? You can do your best, right? But you can never truly transfer this knowledge to that person. Such is the person who transfers from this dunya to the next. When we transfer to the next dunya, we'll look at this life as if it's what? A dream. That this wasn't our true reality. Thus, my dear brothers and sisters, when we speak about death, we are in fact speaking about true and everlasting life. The second reason, my dear brothers and sisters, we discuss death is that if you know where you are headed, right? let's say you're traveling on a work trip, if you know exactly the demands of this work trip, you'll be able to prepare better, right? You can prepare your laptop, you can prepare your presentation, you can prepare your notes, your suitcase. The more information you have regarding your destination and your mission, the more well-prepared you'll be. Same with this dunya. If you understand death more, and if you understand what is that life that's awaiting for you after death, you can begin starting now to prepare for that eventual reality. So that knowledge that comes from death, speaking and constantly reminding yourself that we will all die, is in fact a helpful tool in this dunya to change your life for the better. You find those who always emphasize to themselves the akhirah. Their behaviors and their ways of dealing with other people is much different than people that don't subscribe to this paradigm. There's a beautiful hadith by Amir al muminin in which he states, if I was given the seven continents, right? If I was given the seven continents and whatever is within them, upon that I oppress who? You find many crimes happen you know, every single day. Why? Over a thousand dollars. Over some minor position of authority, right? People squander over these issues. Over meaningless things. Amir al muminin is saying, if I was given everything in this universe, right? The seven continents and what's within them. Upon that I oppress who? A non-Muslim? An atheist? An ant. If I was to oppress an ant, and in what manner? He says, not that I kill the ant, that I take the food that's within the, the ant's mouth away from it. Wallahi, I would not do so. When such a person is a governor of 54 modern countries, what do you think is the state of those citizens? How would such a government be? When someone lives such a pious life that they wouldn't even oppress an ant by not taking food from it, no matter what they're given in return. This is the perspective and paradigm of someone who what? Understands the akhirah. They see the akhirah as if it's what? Right in front of them. يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدَ وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا the disbeliever sees the akhirah as far. Oh, you know, let me enjoy this life and then eventually I'll get to it. Whereas the true believer, my dear brothers and sisters, they see the end of life as near. And that motivates them to what? To engage in righteous action, not to oppress others, not to engage in fraud, not to lie, to engage in sadaqah, to engage in birrul waladin, giving back to your community. All this stems from what? The belief in the akhirah. Thus, it is highly beneficial to be constantly reminded about death. 
you find Ammar and Salman once had a very friendly competition. Ammar told Salman that I have such belief in the Akhirah and I don't have so much hope in this dunya such that every night when I sleep, what? I don't have the hope, the amal that I might wake up. I understand that maybe tonight might be the night Allah decides to take my soul. And I've submitted to that fact. Look at the belief of Ammar. Every single night he goes to sleep knowing this might be his last night. Imagine you live that kind of life. How would you spend your day? Salman looks at him. Tells him, Ammar, you have so much tool al-amal. You have so much hope in this dunya. Says why? He says, Ammar, when I take a breath, I don't know if Allah will give me another. This is the belief of Salman. Are you guaranteed another breath? Do you have a contract with Allah stating how many more births you have? This is a gift from Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, this life. Allah can decide to take it at any single moment without notice. Malakul Maut is constantly hovering upon us. There's no such thing as, oh, you know what? I'll delay my amal. Yeah, I have some religious dues I have to pay. I have to go to Hajj. You know, I'll start getting my act together in 20 years. Are you guaranteed 20 years? Are you guaranteed tomorrow? Are you guaranteed an hour? Life is a gift from Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can decide to take it at any moment he decides. You find, my dear brothers and sisters, last night our topic was our fight with the devil. The dhikr of mawt, the remembrance of death, aids you in your fight against the devil. Right? The devil tells you, look, you're going to have a long life. Enjoy life. Right? Do whatever you want. Then you can engage in repentance. That's how the devil tricks you. He appeals to your tool al-amal. Engage in whatever you want. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. But if you subscribe to the paradigm of death, is that acceptable? Does that make sense? Are you guaranteed to live a long life? We're not guaranteed our days, my dear brothers and sisters. Every day is a blessing of Allah. Every day when you wake up, thank Allah Azza wa for providing you new life. For Allah could have taken it in your sleep. Thus, death aids you in this fight, eternal fight against the devil. There is one final battle between us and the shaitan. We mentioned yesterday, our life, our whole life is what? A struggle between us and the devil. Right? The prayer area is called the mihrab. We're constantly engaging in fighting of the devil. But there is one last fight. Shaitan puts up a fight until this moment. That's called moment of ihtidhar. Ihtidhar is when you're on your deathbed. When you're on your deathbed, you're in your final moment. Something happens that's called sakaratul maut. You're in your final moments. What happens? Ihtidhar comes from the word hudur. Things begin to appear. What appears? Some ghaybi matters, meaning some supernatural figures begin appearing in front of you. According to one hadith, when you're on your deathbed, even if you're a believer, you're in that final moments, you're almost upon that transition from this dunya to the next, who arrives? Who materializes in front of you? Iblis. The devil himself materializes in front of you. In those moments, the hadith says, you feel a thirst like you've never felt in your life. Imagine you go three days in hot weather without drinking water. You'd kill for a sip of water. Right? You experience that in those moments. Shaitan appears in front of you with a cool glass of water. He says, here, this is yours. Take it. You reach your hand. He says, but just one thing. He asks you to do kufr of Allah, disbelief of Allah. This is a very, very difficult test. Because now you say, oh, of course I wouldn't accept. But in that moment, you're suffocating from how hot it is and from how thirsty you are. Are you guaranteed you're going to retract your hand? Or are you going to extend your hand? 
Look at the evil Satan. Even in your final moments, he tries to what? Bring your downfall. He fights with you all your life. You've resisted him all your life. He tries to target you in your final moments. There's a story of during the days of Bani Israel, a really renowned Abid worshiper. He was highly respected in the society. It's a long story, but because of his renowned position, he was given a position of authority upon individuals. He abused that position. He engaged in some hideous sin, hideous crimes. Therefore, his people found out about his crimes. They put him on the what? On the rope about to hang him. In just moments, he went from being someone highly respected in his community, highly respected, position of authority and power, to being what? About to be hanged for his crimes. So in those moments, who comes before him? Shaitan. He says, oh Abid, a oh, worshiper, I was the one who put you in this mess, right? A few hours ago, I was the one that made you commit that crime, so-and-so crime. He says, but now I'm here to save you. The Abid looks at him. He has no recourse. They're about to lift the chair from under him. He's about to go. He says, and what do I have to do? He says, Ukfur Billah. Commit disbelief in God. He commits disbelief in God. The chair is removed. He dies and goes straight to hellfire. You think shaitan is a man of his word? He's a man of integrity and honor? He tries to bring you down even in your final moments. We have to be careful, my dear brothers and sisters. How do we build up strength in those moments? How do we ensure that we will be strong and resilient? The way we do that is that we make, we have a great and consistent track record of fighting shaitan. If throughout our lives we can constantly fight him off, if every time we see someone who's oppressed, we come to their aid. If every time we have that urge to lie, we repress it. If every time we lose our patience with our spouses, we contain ourselves. If we constantly throughout our lives remember death and fight off and ward off the devil in those final moments before death, during that moment of ihtidhar, we can fight the devil as well. It's not going to be easy, my dear brothers and sisters. It's going to be very difficult. But what? It's necessary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَمَزَاتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ Oh Allah, please protect me from the whispers of the devil. Right? Then the verse continues, وَعُوذُ بِكَ رَبِّ أَنْ يَحْضُرُونَ Oh Allah, please protect me when they appear and materialize. Who? The devil. The devil appears and materializes throughout your life many times. We mentioned the hadith yesterday. The heart has metaphorical ears and the... Devil is constantly whispering. Yet, at the moment of your death, he actually materializes. You can actually see him. And that, for many of us, will be our most difficult test of all. And you find the devil is smart. He's very clever. He targets your weak points. Many people, you find their weak point is what? They're a believer. They're a mu'min. But they're afflicted with arrogance. Narcissism. They love having their name out there. People respect them. They just absolutely crave that. And what does the hadith say? That the person that has dharra, even an atom's worth of arrogance, will not smell paradise. Some people, their weak point is their wealth. Some people, their weak point is their family. There's one story that says there was someone on the deathbed during those moments of ihtidhar. This person was really, really going through it, as they say, right? He was sweating. The people around him started doing the talqeen. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. To remind this person of their faith, of their creed in these difficult moments. This person would get up, struggle, right? Really nervous, and then go back down. Three times they would do this. Until they looked at the corner of the room, there was a box. This person told his son, go get me that box. He opened the box, there were a few pieces of paper. He took them and he started ripping them. 
After that, he calmed down. The son asked him, what is that? What just happened? What are those papers? He said, in my final moments, I saw the devil appear before me. And he was using these papers to what? Weigh me down to this dunya. What were these papers? This person was wealthy. He would give micro loans to people, people who were really destitute. They needed some money. They would come to him. He would give them a loan. But even though he was so wealthy, he would every single day knock on those doors, call those individuals. When's my money coming back? When are you going to pay me back? Right? Constantly going after that money that he would lend. The shaitan used that as his weak point to try to entice him to do kufr of Allah. He would tell him, believe in me, I'll give you longer life and you'll get your money back. Obviously, this is a trick. Shaitan can't do that. Death and life is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he realized that and he said, let me uproot that which is causing me my weakness. And alhamdulillah, after that, he was able to peacefully pass away. But had he had just a little less conviction, he would have faltered. And like the Abid of Bani Israel, he would have went straight to hell. So we have to always, always be very careful. There is a scholar in Lebanon, it's narrated that when he was in the hospital on his deathbed, he was moments away from death. Those, you know, those of his loved ones, his friends who were around him, saw all of a sudden, he was sleeping on his deathbed. He got up, he sat down, he looked straight, and he said, Assalamu alaikum ya Amir al Mu'mineen. The believer, my dear brothers and sisters, upon these difficult moments of ihtidar, who appears? If you took the Qur'an as your friend, the hadith says the Qur'an will materialize and be there for you. If you took the Ahlul Bayt as your guardians in that moment of difficulty, the Ahlul Bayt will be there for you. What honor? What greater honor can you have than in your final moments you see Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them? And thus, my dear brothers and sisters, death, if you are a fervent believer of Allah, you have the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt, death should not scare you. Death is simply a transition into a newer and a greater chapter in your life. That's what death is. And you find Al Qas ibn al Hassan, alaykum as upon asked by his uncle, Imam al Hussein, how do you view death? What was his response? Oh, my uncle, death for you is sweeter than honey. This is the perspective of a believer. Look at this shining moon. He says, oh, uncle, death for you is sweeter than honey. Al-Qasim ibn al-Hasan was only two or three years old when his father, Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, peace be upon him, was martyred, when he was poisoned. Thus, it was who? His uncle, Imam al Hussein that practically raised him. He instilled within him a great moral education such that this moon shined brighter than the stars on the day of Ashura. The day before Ashura, after Imam al Hussein called all his companions, he told them tomorrow is the day of Shidda and many of you, if not all of you, will be martyred. He came to his uncle, he told him, Oh uncle, وَهَلْ أَنَا مِمَّنْ يُقْتَلْ Am I also going to be someone that's going to be killed? Qasim is 13 years old. He's a young boy. It's natural. Any young child would be what? Scared of death. Imam al Hussein wanted to test him. He told him, Ya Bunay, كَيْفَ وَجَدْتَ الْمَوْتِ My son, how do you find death? He wants to test his nephew. He says, Ammah al fika ahla min al asal. Oh, uncle, death for you, for your sake, and your path is sweeter than honey. Inshallah, we can all attain such a level where we see death as sweeter than honey if it's for the sake of Allah. Azza wa Jal. The night passes and it's the day of Ashura. Al Qasim sees the massacred bodies of the companions. He looks to his right and he sees the body of Ali ibn al-Akbar. He sees the body of Abu Fadl al-Abbas He can't handle it. He hears the cries of the children, the wailing of the woman. He goes to his mother, he kisses her. 
He kisses his mother Ramla goodbye and it's as if he tells her, oh mother, if you see a young person, a young man like me, remember me. And if you drink water again, remember me. He farewells his mother and then he goes to his uncle, Imam al Hussein. He goes, he tells him, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, I can't bear seeing this anymore. Seeing the wails of the woman and the cries of the children, please give me permission to go and fight these enemies. Now with all of the companions and all of the family members of the imam, whenever they would come to the imam and ask, he would refuse them, then they would insist, he would refuse, they would keep on insisting until he would give them permission. But for Qasim, Imam al Hussein gave an absolute no. He said, Qasim, you're all that I have of my brother, Imam al Hassan. You're a 13 year old boy. How can I let you go? Look at the heart of Imam al Hussein. He can't let him go. Al Qasim, after he's so heartbroken, he falls upon the feet of Imam al Hussein. He starts kissing the feet of Imam al Hussein. He gets up, he starts hugging. Imam al Hussein, they both start crying. They start crying and crying until they both fall unconscious. The hadith says this was the only time on the day of Ashura Imam al Hussein fell unconscious. After they woke up, he asked his uncle one last time for permission. And Imam al Hussein looked at him. He kissed him and he bid him farewell. Al Qasim, he wore his armor. He placed the turban of his father, Imam Al Hassan, upon his head. He mounted his horse and he started going towards the camp of the enemies. Now, the enemies, they see this young child that they've never seen before. Who is he? They start murmuring. Is he another son of Imam Al Hussein? We've already killed them all. Who is he? He goes and he begins introducing himself. He says, إِن تُنْكِرُونِي فَأَنَا نَجْلُ الْحَسَنِ صِبْطُ النَّبِيِّ الْمُصْطَفَى وَالْمُؤْتَمَنْ أَذَا حُسَيْنٌ كَالْأَسِيرِ الْمُرْتَهَنْ لَا صَقُوا صَوْبَ الْمُزُنْ I am Qasim, the son of Hassan I am the grandson of Rasulullah. Do you not see Hussein is surrounded by the enemies, by those that have no mercy? He begins fighting the enemies. He's a 13 year old boy, but he begins slaying the enemies. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, There's no way we can overpower him other than by surrounding him. The enemies begin encircling him, tightening the circle, surrounding him. Look at these cowardly enemies. Hundreds of enemies and they, yet they can't overpower one young boy. They begin circling Al-Qasim and Al-Hassan until all of a sudden the buckle on his sandal is undone. He bends over to fix his sandal when, oh believers, one of the cursed enemies comes from behind and he strikes him on his head. He fell to the ground. Now all the other companions, when they fall to the ground, they look at the camp of Aba Abdullah and they yell out, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. But Al Qasim is a young child. He's a young boy. He looks at the camp and he yells out, Amma hadrikni. My uncle, please come save me. Imam Al Hussein hears the cries of Al Qasim. He begins running towards Al Qasim. The enemies disperse when they see the Imam. He dismounts from his horse. He falls upon the body of Al Qasim. But by then it was too late. Al Qasim's soul had departed his body. Imam Al Hussein looks at his nephew. He begins crying. He says, Ya Azzu ala ammika an tunadi fala yujibuk. Aw yujibuka fala yugni ank. It's difficult upon the heart of your uncle that you call him and he can't respond. Or that your uncle responds but he can't help you. Imam al Hussein is heartbroken from all the tragedies of the day of Ashura. He tries carrying the body of Al Qasim back to the tent, but his feet are dragging through the sand. Why? Because Abba Abdullah has no energy at this point. He begins dragging his body until he gets to the camp. 
and he places the body of Al Qasim by the body of Ali al Akbar. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Fasayalamu alladhina zalamu ala Muhammadin. Ayy munqalab yanqalibun. Wal'aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Assalamu alaikum.